Some of Caravaggio's dichotomous symmetries incorporate cuts, and some of his cuts give rise to symmetries. For example, here is Judith and Holofernes. I remember this Italian class of, of, of uh, uh, pupils about 10 years in, in one of the many Caravaggio exhibitions of the last years, and these were, these were pupils of seven years of age, and they were standing with the, with the teacher in front of the painting. And look how, how lovely this is modulated. And, and, and she was explaining all the aesthetic qualities of this painting to the children. Um, and they liked it. Look how the blood is coming out of them. <laughs> I like this, <laughs> in a way. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> here's Judith and Holofernes from the gallery of the Palazzo Barberini. Uh, it seems to me that the picture is characterized by at least two ruptures. On one hand, there is, of course, the cut that separates a head from its body. And on the other hand, there is the body of the cutter, which at the same time, at the same mo moment, in a certain way, is bursting open or dividing. Well, also, always concentrates very much, of course, on, the, on this, on this uh, uh, um, body of Holofernes, who is cut in this moment, but the cutter herself is also divided at the moment of cutting. Not only is Judith wearing a dress that is divided along the central axis of her body, the two sides of this dress being pushed farther apart by her swelling breast, this rift continues onward and passes through the woman's face. The harshly drawn part in her hair, the part, uh, is striking, as it is in many paintings of Caravaggio. It's very clearly accentuated. As is, even more striking and more important is the furrow in her brow. In enacting the cut, Judith herself experiences a split. Everything seems to double or divide in two. Beheading is joined by the art of splitting faces or breaking them in half. Caravaggio is great at it. One might wonder why. Why should he split faces when they are already in themselves bilaterally symmetrical forms? Perhaps because it is difficult to see them as such. Normally we perceive a face as a unity. Indeed, the face is a paradigm of what we call unity or wholeness. In order to see it as a potentially divided thing, one must go to great lengths, such as Caravaggio does in his design of Judith's face. You need to produce the doubleness of the face, because normally it has got this unity for all its uh, doublings, uh, in, in spite of all its doublings. The face has to receive a crack along its meridian. This is exactly the context for the device, which this painter utilizes multiple times, of dividing a pair of eyes so that between them is driven the difference between life and death. The head of Goliath, I'm struggling with the microphone, the head of Goliath in the famous painting in the Maria Borghese in Rome is the most well known but by no means the only example. Between the two eyes lies the brink of the moment of death, the deadly impact whose force still reverberates in the wound to the brow or at this moment is still reverberating. The wound, by the way, is a crunch point. It has something of the quality of the Cyclops eye, which would restore the unity of the face in a monstrous fashion. This might be one reason why Caravaggio not only divided this face, but also, at least to an extent, doubled it. Didn't only divide this and cut in a way this face, he doubled it. Indeed, the painting is full of curious echo effects. Apart from the resonance between the faces of perpetrator and victim, 
beautiful things written about this, I think by Michael Fried and also by uh, Dutois and Berzani. Uh, Berzani. Uh, apart from the resonances between the faces of perpetrator and victim, a fold in David's shirt produces a hollow that answers Goliath's gaping mouth. Uh, well, while the corner of his white garment hanging down seems to imitate the movement of the stream of blood. David's nipple can be seen in analogy to the wound in Goliath's brow and hence as a type of eye. It is as though Goliath's face is imprinting or inscribing itself on David's body. So this is the gaping mouth, the hollow thing here. The blood streaming, not very clearly to be seen here. Another analogy, and of course, the puncture of the nipple and the impact uh, here kind of has some kind of shadow. This uh, again in the in David, David um, a little bit it, it, the structure is similar to the to the all the fairness structurally. But let's let's come back to the motive of the book. What is its particular significance in and for Caravaggio's painting? Sorry that I'm so slow up to today, I'm a little bit. Um, um, what is the significance of the book? It is perhaps that the book is more than simply a motif. It is also a medium that mediates between two planes, the painted bodies on the one hand and the paintings in which the bodies are painted on the other hand. The motive or medium of the open book lies halfway between bodies and paintings. It is a flat, it is flat like the paintings, the book is flat like the paintings, and yet substantial like the bodies. Like some of Caravaggio's paintings, it is a type of diptych. Book is a type of diptych, and like some of the bodies he painted, its central axis is not presided over by a head. So there's this, one can reason about, and I think one can find formalistic explanations for the reason why the book is so important, a motive in Caravaggio's painting. In the Hieronymus, Geronimo uh, of the Galleria Borghese, the next example, the action and the pictorial structure are essentially carried by books. Books are among the pictures actors or actants, to use a, a structural list term, uh, which is suitable here at the ESS. In addition of no other painting by Caravaggio, can it be more rightly asserted that it is a latent diptych? Hieronymus, how do you call him, Hieronymus? Hieronymus is small enough, the skull on the other side he's, he's like myself, and the skull on the other side is large enough and also is positioned high uh, enough so that the two can appear as a symmetrical pair. The pair of authors, Leo Bersani and Ulysse Dutois, it's interesting that the pair of authors um, has already described this this double figure very nicely. Maybe it's, maybe it's, there's some reason why this pair of authors has seen this, this pairing so clearly, uh, uh, the doubleness so clearly. In the picture's axis of symmetry lies a book. That's what they uh, uh, hinted at. Uh, the fold of the book is related to, to the crook in Hieronymus' right arm. This motive of the crook of the arm is repeated upside down in the adjacent bunch of red fabric. One recalls the association of two fold objects, music book square compass in the armor in Berlin. Uh, I, I think it's very clear, you know, that, uh, very clear that you, you have got the, you've got the book structure, you've got the articulation of the limb, and you've got this, and everything is in the central uh, axis. Uh, more or less of the, of, of the painting. Um, the difference is that here in Hieronymus, 
or Hieronymus, the group of motifs is additionally coupled with the virtual band or buckle that separates the twofold picture and holds it together. To the left, the skull, which itself is resting on a book. Um, of course, a little bit to the side of its fold, that's not crowning it. So this is not, the skull is not given uh, uh, the central axis uh, a privilege. To the left side and to the right, the skull bent over another book. Hieronymus, Hieronymus skull of the living translator, the skull of the living translator. Between the two, the fold in the image. I see the death's head as an observer, and I think this is already in Bersani and Dutois, I think I see the death's head as an observer that regards the scene of writing. Its gaze is there, though it has no eyes while Hieronymus gazes there, though his eyes are not visible. Of course, there's this, you don't see his eyes, uh, his gaze is there, and of course here the, the holes, but the gaze is there. Um, apparently both skulls with their invisible, visible gazes are involved in the tra translation work, or in the books at any rate. The dead and inanimate is also making its inscription. Does the extended arm belong to Hieronymus alone? It, together with the quill dipped in black ink, reaches into the between space of death and life, which in this picture is simultaneously a between space of the colors white and red. Of course, very. So this is the painting where Caravaggio spelled out some of the principles of his art most clearly. Um, um, of course, you know, I wanted to say it's, basically, it's also an arm with two heads. It can be seen as an arm with two heads. Just the arm and two, two scripts. So this kind of... Uh, <coughs> Of course, the comparison of the painting with an open book can also be illuminating when the painting under dis discussion does not itself feature a book, notebook, or the like. Perhaps Caravaggio's most strikingly symmetrical composed picture, Doubting Thomas in, in Potsdam, um, foregoes these things entirely. One might doubt whether this painting has an imaginary hinge at all since in the central axis of the picture, closing the composition at the top, the head of a witness appears. But this head is really not a dominant principle and therefore can do nothing to redeem the problem of the missing head. Rather, it is significant that Caravaggio had the idea of re reflect the left contour line of Christ and the wound in his side, bringing it to the right, into the other side of the picture. So there's not only that there's uh, some kind of symmetrical, uh, symmetrical uh, outline to the whole, which may have been brought out by the use of the Carta Lucida, uh, a transparent uh, a paper which he turned to the other side. But there's also, this is an uh, observation by Nicola Sutor, there's also, of course, the relations between these two kinds of discontinuities um, uh, here. Um, uh, and actually, the symmetry of the contours may be only one means of making this even more uh, clear that there is this kind of mirroring uh, effect uh, or doubling. <coughs> doubling is better here. He filled the reflected contour with the figure of another disciple and identified the reflected wound with the burst seam on St. Thomas' sleeve. This burst or bursting seam can be taken as the actual eye of the doubter. The axis of symmetry is also emphasized by the vertically falling hem of, uh, of Thomas Coat. The connection between doubting and doubling, il dubbio e il doppio. The Apostle Thomas was also called Didymus, twin. This connection has perhaps never been so precisely and poignant, point, can't express this, poignantly expressed in any other artwork. The connection between doubt and two, um, which is very palpable in some languages. 
in German also, Zweifel and Zwei. Um, it is not a matter and, and well, Thomas Didymus. It's, it's not, it doesn't come as a surprise that Thomas is the one doubting. Didymus, the twin, is doubting. Uh, it is no, not a matter of the number two as such, but of that which lies, lies between two things, bodies or objects, and keeps them separate, but also connecting them. This is analogous on the level of pictorial syntax to the axis of symmetry, conceived as a difficult passage. Thomas is passing through this axis. The axis is passing through him. His fixed stare shows that, that at this moment he is not present with himself, and thus also is not present in the situation. Like the extended arm of Hieronymus, the translator, he is in a space that is not at a location, that is not a location or condition, but rather is situated between two locations or conditions. He perhaps doesn't doubt anymore, but rather is situated between two locations or conditions. Uh, is, but he, but doesn't believe yet either. He, he, he perhaps doesn't doubt anymore, but doesn't believe yet in either. Every doubter, every doubter is in a between state. He cannot or will not commit himself. He takes away the authority of one thing without placing another thing in the position of, of the first. The Lazino di Buridan. Uh, Caravaggio shows something more complicated than this. He shows a person who has left the between state of doubt without having arrived at the firm ground of certainty. What he presents to view lies precisely between doubt with its duplicitous halves and one fold certainty. In this respect, what takes place in this painting is something like an abysmal doubling, the mise en abîme of in-betweenness. I really admit that these are singular cases. This is a singular case. Every painting by Caravaggio is a singular case that requires a specific viewing and analysis. That's why what I'm doing here is brutal in one kind, because I'm uh, forcing all these different paintings on one plane. Uh, using technical devices like projections to make them homogeneous and so on. However, with respect to the phenomenon of the double or duplicitous, a couple of generalizations, generalizations are possible. With some exaggeration, one could say Caravaggio loves bilateral symmetries on account of their axis. What fascinates him about these axes may have become clear in the preceding discussion. Axes can function as buckles or folds. They interrupt connections, but also produce them, and sometimes they do the one by doing the other. Things often appear in the central axis of Caravaggio's paintings that are characterized by a fold, a bend, or a break. For instance, the neck of a lute in Caravaggio's concerto in concert in New York, a harshly cut framing element such as in the Madonna of Loreto. At least this I have, of course, but you know it. You know it that this is one of, one of the striking elements, that there's, that there's this framing element uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the central axis of a painting at which you arrive are just after having crossed the threshold of the church. You go at the threshold, and then you've got the threshold uh, motif in the painting, which is then in the, I think, first or second chapel to the left. Um, an even harsher stony edge, as in the entombment from the Chiesa Nuova, or a loaf of bread that has been broken in half in the supper at Emmaus in the Brera, where the axis of symmetry of Jesus' face runs exactly to the central break. Uh, um, as a, this is a painter who is really very precise about axis of faces. You can see this many times that he... And one could talk of the London picture also, but it's, of course, the axis of the face points to the loaf of bread and the load of bread is broken. Yeah, 
you see, so it's like you access and break. Uh, 